With that, let's get on to some of our stats. I shared at Blink on 10 this alarming uh, trend that we, we were looking at um, in terms of how quickly this event was growing. So I thought I would just outline a little bit more about who's here this time around. So going through Blink on 8 through to where we are today, um, first, I've noticed that there is a uh, actually an increase in the percentage of attendees who are non-Googlers. That's fantastic. I think it's awesome that we are diversifying the event and we're hearing from uh, more voices of Chromium developers everywhere. The second thing, though, was this concerning stat that we might not be on track to hit our growth targets. Oh, no. Um, in fact, I had to revise uh, the growth rate for, for BlakeCon uh, projecting into the future. And I, I always find this alarming because, I mean, we're, on, we're sort of on a trend to oblivion right here. Fortunately, um, I did some thinking about this, and, and I came up with a set of alternative facts. Um, if we just break this down by year, then we're much better off. We can, you know, we can add Blink on 10 and Blink on 11 together, uh, apply a log scale. And fortunately, I've, I've also added a trend line here so we can better understand the data. And we're safe. Good news, everyone. Thanks so much for joining. I'd like to invite Rick up for the keynote. Thanks, PJ. All right. Uh, so for ho folks who don't know me, uh, I'm Rick Byers. I'm the director of engineering for the Blink team. And BlinkCon is my favorite event of the year. I love seeing all the enthusiasm and all the engineering talent and creativity here, uh, you know, all aligned around our common goal of making the web better. It's awesome. Um, so normally this is the point where someone from Google stands up and like tells you like our view of the future of the web and why everything you all are doing is so important to society. It really is, by the way. And, and why like you have such a huge opportunity to help make the web better. You really do. But I'm not going to do that this time. If that's what you were hoping for, um, I suggest you watch uh, Anil's CDS keynote from Monday. Uh, I was pretty impressed by the overall tone. I heard from a number of you, uh, a number of folks who were, uh, the central message was, Let's celebrate the we in web, right? This is a community and Chromium is a piece of it. Google's a piece of it, um, but it's, it's you know, a small piece of a much, much larger uh, community. So uh, I'm, I'm not gonna try to compete with Anil's charisma uh, and his like professionalism and kind of telling the story, um, but I do wanna model his humility. Uh, in particular, Chromium, the Chromium development community, like we're a community and like every community, I think it's important that we take some time to reflect on what matters to us, what are our values. So in that spirit, uh, sometime during the conference, I hope you all will take a moment to fill in this survey. This is uh, talking with several of you, we've compiled a, a set of values that we've heard that people care about, um, and what is most important to you in your work in the Chromium project. And there's a spot also to write some additional ones in. Um, I, th I think this is important, especially when we have to make tough trade-offs, right? There is not, we can't be everything for everybody. Like a great example is, uh, you know, we all want to maximize our engineering productivity um, and avoid unnecessary process and overhead, but we also want to maximize the quality of our code base, right? And so there's tensions here. And so rather than, you know, any of us try to say, this is the way, right? We'd like to hear from more of you to make sure that we're, that th those of us that help organize the community are reflecting the values of the community as a whole. This is also a great forcing function. As you're thinking about this, use it as a conversation starter, right? This BlinkCon is like the one time where we can have some of these tough conversations with each other and we can kind of talk openly and frankly about like what matters to us and what are the things that make, what are the things that we all share in common, right? We all care about an open thriving web, but what are the things that make some of our perspectives unique from each other? And that's a great topic of conversation at BlinkCon. All that said, I can't help, I'm a data junkie, I can't help but share, uh, use this few minutes that I've got here to share some data with you uh, that I think is meaningful, but you should make your own decision of, of what you think of this data. Here, here's a fun one, first of all. Um, we, we want people to, to want to use the web, right? So here's a trend in Japan for people using uh, Android devices on 4G networks, and it looks like people in Japan uh, use the web a lot less at the end of the month than at the beginning of the month. That's odd. What do we make of that data? Why would it be that people use the web less? Well, if we look at some other th things, if we graph uh, page load time, 
uh, in Japan for the same cohort, we say, oh, wow, at the end of the month, page load time really goes up. That's odd. What could explain this? Well, it turns out almost every carrier in Japan has data caps. And when you hit your data cap, you get throttled to 2G. So what this tells us is there's a really strong correlation between pages loading slower and people choosing not to use the web. Hopefully, you know, that's something that we've, we, I think we all know, and we have lots of data that tells us this, but I think this was a Kenji put together this visualization that I thought was a nice, other compelling view of that. So, uh, how, oh, and also we know that uh, when the web gets faster, businesses make more money on the web. And this is really important, right? The web is this economic engine, and of course it has all sorts of non-economic value, but the economic value I think is really critical to its, to its future. And so here's a slide that we shared at, the, at CDS. And this is we, we, uh, when we ship the feature stale where we validate in partnership working with Mozilla, right? Firefox and Chromium both ship stale where we validate. We did an experiment with Google Ads teams and found that by loading ad scripts, the number of ad scripts that load within the first 500 milliseconds of a page load, stale where we validate allowed us to increase that by 2%. Just 2% more of the ad scripts loaded within the first half second of a page load. And publishers everywhere on the web who are using Google Ads to monetize their content made half a percent more revenue. Half a percent more ad revenue for the entire web ad supported ecosystem is a lot of money. It's from one little feature that we did in Chromium. I think this is you know, something we should look for more opportunities to do. So how is the web doing in terms of performance? Well, the, one of the main metrics we, we work on is FCP, first content full paint. This is a graph of Chrome for Android. Obviously Android uh, mobile is where we struggle the most with performance, right? We know the web does fairly well on desktop, but uh, you know, mobile is often constrained from network, per, uh, but also the you know, chips and RAM are often very constrained. So this is all Chrome users uh, on Chrome for Android. How is first content full paint done over the past year? And as you can see, at the median 95th and 99th percentile, there's a really good trend here. And this is kind of shocking. Like for the years and years that we've been watching our real user metrics from the wild, we don't see trends like this. This is like over one year, a 12% decrease. There's a bit of a bump there at the end. Don't worry too much. You know, we did have a regression, um, and we think we we're still making sure we understand all of it. We think it's probably mostly about measurement and not actual user experience. But uh, it did largely recover in 78. But other than that regression, most of this is not about changes in Chromium. What we can see is almost all of this is about changes in the ecosystem, and we think this is because the ecosystem is finally getting the message that. First content full paint, getting pictures, pixels on the screen as fast as possible is really important. It's important to your business success, it's important to users' perception of the web. We've been pushing this across all of our tools, right? Google Search has it now in the Search Console. Um, and, and so we're seeing that over the past year, websites have meaningfully gotten faster to load the first pixel. Unfortunately, this is not obviously the whole story of performance. There's lots of other measures of performance. So over the last couple of years, we've worked very hard to come up with new metrics that do a better job of capturing the whole experience. So I'm gonna share some early data with you here. Um, first one is LCP. This is largest contentful paint. After a lot of research, we think this correlates pretty well with the user's perception of the page is useful now. Uh, and it's like, what's the largest image or text block or something? When does it become available? And we've only got two months of data here, but it's, you know, initial trend is not looking great. Um, and what worries me even more is the absolute value. Right? We talk about how people's attention starts to wane after a couple seconds. The one in 20 page loads the, getting the main thing on the screen takes more than eight seconds. That's a long time for people to wait. So I think that's something for us to work on. Of course, visual loading is not the only important thing. There's lots of things that are important, but another area that we focused is as people push to improve visual loading, uh, we saw like a lot of use of server-side rendering and then uh, client-side hydration that runs a lot of JavaScript, which means even though the page looks like it's there, it's not really ready to be used yet. So the metric that we're working to try to capture that in the wild is first input delay. This is a measure of when the user actually goes to interact with your page, how long is that interaction just blocked and can't even start to process because the main thread is busy. And so we've got a bit more data on this. Uh, we've got about four months worth of data. Uh, and uh, again, you know, the trend is not looking great. Um, uh, you know, it's, I guess we could, you know, at the tail, it kind of went up and down, but otherwise it's roughly flat. We're only seeing a few percentage points change here. Um, but again, the absolute value is kind of worrying. One, one in 20 page loads, on Chrome for Android, when the user says, oh, I want to go do something on this page, they're waiting at least 300 milliseconds. I don't know, does anyone, remember the tap delay? Remember how it used to be that like all mobile browsers, you would tap and it would take 300 milliseconds before it did anything, right? That, it just feels terrible. It's, it's not a modern computing experience to feel that. So I think this is another area we need to be working on together. 
so but performance obviously isn't the only thing that matters. There's lots of other things that matter. We've been relying on, we've been doing a lot more developer surveys. We really want to try to improve the satisfaction of web developers. And one of the key things we've seen in the MDN needs assessment survey that we partnered with Mozilla on doing is developers are still frustrated by interop. We've been harping on this for a while. Um, data that we're use, looking at now that we think is useful is what are the fr what, how many web platform tests are there that fail uniquely in only a single engine? This is a number that we think needs to be driven down. And this is a collaboration. We had folks at the WebKit contributors meeting last week uh, working with our friends at Apple, um, but we're also working with Mozilla. And we think across the entire web community, we think this is a number that we can meaningfully move down together to say it's less, it should be rare that an engine has uniquely uh, quirky behavior. Another data uh, I want to share is um, that I think we've never really talked about before is the, the kind of distribution of how the web gets used. So this is a graph that shows, you know, we're so used to thinking about who are our top partners. You know what, you know, I'm sure there's many people from Facebook in the audience, right? There's lots of other really major uh, web properties. And those, it's really important that we work with top partners. It turns out that about the top 100 origins, and this is normalizing, ignoring the TLD, because you know sites like google.ca, google.com, um, the top 100, 100 origins ac account for about a third of all page loads in Chrome. Uh, and, that, and we also looked at time spent. It's roughly the same. So you, know, so you can think about top 100 origins is about a third of the user experience. And if our goal is to improve the user experience in aggregate, we can get a third of the way there by influencing 100 sites. Great. But if we want to get 2 thirds of the way there, we got to influence about another 10,000 sites. And if we want to get anywhere beyond that, we've got to start talking about influencing a million sites, right, or more. So this, to me, tells us that, uh, yes, working with top partners is important, um, but let's really think about scaled activation. How do we influence the web as a whole, right? How do we, how, where do we find the tools, the CMSs, the frameworks that these sites beyond the top 10,000 are using that we can apply a bit of leverage to help those sites uh, get better at scale? It doesn't, that's not going to work by individual outreach to individual sites. Also, our community is becoming more diverse. Um, this is uh, the number of contributors. And I just looked at the Blink directory because that's an area of active collaboration. Obviously, there's lots of other directories that have active collaboration, V8, DevTools, others. But for the Blink directory, uh, we're seeing our largest number of contributors ever in 2019. Uh, we're up at uh, 860, pretty big increase from last year. So this is exciting to see. And the year, year isn't even done yet. This is going to be even higher, hopefully, by the end of the year. And also, when we look at fraction of commits to Blink coming from non-Googlers. This is a, a stat I've kind of wanted to show in the past. And to be honest, I don't want to shy away from showing bad graphs, but I've never shown this graph before because I found it depressing. Mm -hmm. um, and this is the first year I can show it and say, over, between 2018 and 2019, the number of commits in Blink has doubled. The number of non-Google commits in Blink has doubled. And there's a bit of a breakdown here. Um, and, and so uh, this, I think, is really exciting. So speaking of commits to Blink, and what are the changes? I'd like to hand it over to Ian, who's going to run through some of the big changes over the last six months. Hello. <laughs> Let me find the magic button that raises this. Hooray. OK, hello. I am the random Blink engineer that typically shows all of you what you've all done in the last six months Oh, with this up top. Um, so usually we show, you know, pretty graphs of the number of intents to implement and things like that. This, that, that sounded too exciting. So this time I've just listed them all out. If you see something that you've worked on, go woo for me. You ready? If no one does this, I can assume that no one cares about their feature and I can delete lots of code. So you've all be warned. Ready? Nothing? Okay, so I can delete. <laughs> I can delete their SMS OTP receiver API. All right. Hey! <laughs> no, edit, edit context save here. I can rip. No, nothing. All right, hey. Um, what, one important to note thing is that this is no longer intent to implement. This is intent to prototype. Uh, this was a recent change uh, that we announced. I think we announced this at CDS um, that this is now becoming intent to prototype. Um, so look for that soon. Um, next. You know, in, intent to implement to solve the first set. We've had lots of intense experiments. Um, one interesting one is the JS self profiling API, which I believe that Facebook is running an origin trial with at the moment. Um, 
there's a bunch of other great things. There's a bunch of Fugu APIs in here that are running origin trials at the moment. Um, and we've shipped a lot of stuff in the last six months as well. Um, one interesting thing here is the new text metrics API in Canvas. These you know, allows developers to have the ascent and descent, um, as well as other, you know, the bounding box of text in the Canvas API. Um, you know, lots of other stuff here. Uh, we're shipping the min, max, and clamp functions in CSS. This allows you to say width between the minimum of one EM and 10 pixels, for example. Um, you know, lots of animations v1, uh, web animations v1 work. So things like animation is pending. Um, hooray! Um, bunch of, you know, inline web VTT styling improvements. Um, a huge congratulations to the WebXR team. Um, it's been a long time coming, but they, in the last six months, have shipped uh, the WebXR API. So that is a you know, really massive passive. Um, another one on the slide that is shipped recently is the CSS backdrop filter. Um, I think this is already out. Hey! This has also been a long time coming. Um, I believe that this is around 1% of all page loads um, being used so far. So this is something that developers have you know, really wanted. Um, and we also do, you know, we do removals as well. Um, one interesting one here is that WebKit appearance um, this has been a long source of compat pain uh, from Mozilla in particular. Um, and they were about to you know, ship all of the keywords and we went, no, don't do that. Um, so we did a bunch of cleanup and managed to unship a lot of things. This means that you can't now style a checkbox like a button, for example, and do crazy combinations like that. Um, so you know, huge congratulations to T. Kent for getting that through. Um, if I didn't talk about your feature, it's not that it's not important, it's just you didn't pay me enough money. Um, we reached Chromebug's number one million. Hooray! I'm pretty sure people were trying to camp because I looked around this range and there was a lot of dummy bug entries. So congratulations uh, to the Chromebug contributor who managed to snag that one. Um, here's to getting to 10 million. Um, there's been a lot of, if you've you know, been on any review list, you've seen lots of code improvements um, done by the folks at Agalia. So Mojification is 93% done now. Onion Soup is 87% done. Um, you know, a huge amount of, we've, uh, the Agalia folks managed to room WTF timer, WTF C string, um, and switching things to the new Mojo syntax. The graph there is, I believe, the number of old Mojo types, and it's going down and to the right, which is, Good. Um, what else? There's a lot of things happening in the Fugu world, um, if you haven't heard. Um, so this is specifically uh, for mobile apps. There's, you know, in Origin Trial, the Contact Picker, contact picker API, the SMS Receiver API. Um, for desktop apps, one that I'm particularly excited about is the Native File System API. This should allow Photoshop-style apps or Code Editor-style apps to, you know, deal with the native file system, which is really exciting. Um, there's also, you know, uh, the Web Serial API I'm personally very excited about. This will allow me to connect with all of my random hardware at home. This is very exciting. Um, and there's been a lot of work by the uh, friends at Intel on hardware capabilities, so things like the wake screen lock and the web NFC APIs. Um, so huge congratulations to the Fugu team for getting this right. Um, the V8 team have been very busy. Um, they uh, are shipping pointer compression on M80. Uh, this reduces renderer memory size by around 10% on 64-bit ARM. This is massive. Um, you know, it's been a long, you know, sort of joke that, you know, Chrome uses a lot of memory, and this moves it by such a huge amount. Um, and this also on ARM64, uh, you know, gains a pretty uh, big improvement of about 3%. Um, this graph here, I believe, is the top 25 sites and uh, JavaScript performance. And the green line is lower than the red line, which is good. Um, so huge, you know, uh, V8 team have actually been killing it there. Um, a lot of the V8 Lite um, optimizations that were talked about last BlinkCon have shipped in M78. Um, this includes lazy feedback allocation, lazy source positions. Um, and this, uh, in addition to that previous uh, heap size reduction, uh, this reduces the V8 heat by 18% with no performance penalty, which is really impressive stuff. Um, 
there's also been a lot of work unifying the oil pan and the V8 uh, heap. Um, so now we've got a unified heap. Uh, there's no more ping-ponging between the two garbage collectors going from V8 into Blink into V8 into Blink. Um, and we've now also got uh, concurrent oil pan sweeping so we can reclaim objects on the main thread concurrently. Um, and this reduces time sweeping by 50%. Um, so huge congratulations to the V8 team for shipping all of that. It's really exciting. All right, how am I going on time? Oh my God, I need to go faster. All right, WebAssembly. Um, WebAssembly have been spending a lot of time uh, you know, uh, improving startup performance. Um, so background compilation is now faster. Um, you can see here that the graph shows if you've got more cores, turbofan, turbofan compilation is faster. It basically, you, can, you, know, uh, you get linear scaling, um, which is really, uh, really impressive. Um, and also, they've been parallelizing wrapper creation. Um, so this is really cool stuff coming from the WebAssembly team. Um, the loading and network teams have been busy as well. Uh, this graph I really loved. Um, this is how fast WebSocket has been per release. So you can see, you know, Chrome 75, it's sitting around, you know, the throughput's about 125. And now with 78, it's, you know, above 750. Um, this is, you know, really great performance improvements there. Um, this is mainly due to, you know, removing memory copies, all sorts of stuff. Um, and navigation loader is now completely in the browser process. Um, so there's almost no thread hops during navigation in the browser process, which should speed up uh, user experience uh, quite a lot. Um, there's been lots of uh, responding to uh, memory pressure signals from Android, um, which is reducing the high percentile um, metrics on Android, which is really great to see as well. Um, we've also found cases where we're leaking a lot of windows um, 99th percentile, um, you know, we've got over 200 leaking windows, which is not great. So we can understand that better. Um, one thing that the Tokyo team has been working on and other people is the BF cache. Um, we've got a video. Well, they're like, oh, it's loading. Oh, this is very exciting. What's the one on the left? So we load a page. That's a little bit slow. And when we go back, one is faster than the other. Ridiculously so. Um, this is really exciting. Um, this, you know, you can just see there that that is going to improve the user experience substantially with BF Cache. So this is really exciting to see. Um, we've been busy in, busy in the rendering world. Um, we shipped the first big bit, as I like to call it, of Layout and G. Uh, this managed to reduce paint time by 5%. We closed approximately 10 to 15% of all open layout bugs. Um, layout's traditionally one of the components that's got the highest number of bugs inside of Blink. Um, and we've improved the uh, quality and performance, particularly of com languages with complex scripts. So this is things like Arabic or Hebrew, languages like that. Um, Blink gen property trees um, shipped in M75 as well. Uh, this unifies the property tree generation between Blink and CC. After this launch, uh, the paint team managed to remove 13,000 lines of code, um, which is pretty massive and it fixed lots of really nasty bugs um, that developers constantly ran into re relating uh, to just clipping and scrolling. Um, more from the DOM team, um, there's a form controls visual refresh, which is a collaboration between Microsoft and Google contributors. Um, you can see the one on the left looks like it was from the 1990s and the one on the right doesn't, which is very exciting. Um, and there's also been a lot of uh, custom element improvements in this time period as well. Am I going for time? Oh dear, okay. Um, there's been a lot of work happening in compositing. Um, so, you know, lots of power reduction improvements in video presentation. Uh, also shipping out of process raster as well recently. Um, the graph there shows the scroll latency improvement on the 99th percentile on Windows is down about 20%. Um, which is really great to see as well. Um, and in sort of the more web API uh, side of Canvas and graphics, um, uh, ship vector printing of two graphics, uh, reduced memory in the Canvas stack, lots of really, really great stuff there as well. Um, the media team, this, this slide came in a little bit late, so it's a little bit less fleshed out. Um, but the media team shipped the AV1 codec um, over 5 billion hours of AV1, AV, uh, AV1 has already been served on YouTube, um, which is a pretty massive start. 
Um, accessibility, there's been lots of contribu contributions from the Microsoft team over the last six months. Um, so there's now UI automation support. Uh, there's a bunch of PDF accessibility improvements. Um, this resulted in the Microsoft team gaining four committers and three owners in this area of the code base as well. Um, so this is really important work that they you know, really landed here. Um, the Google team have obviously been doing a lot of reviews from the Microsoft contributors, um, and they also uh, you know, made images that traditionally have been inaccessible uh, to vision impaired users accessible. So we run uh, images, so say if there's an image of a fruit bowl uh, that isn't annotated with alt text, I'm speaking too loud, I'm making things drop off on the podium, there we are. Um, uh, we can actually you know, read that with machine learning and provide a usable, uh, a user visible description uh, through a screen reader or other technology, um, which is pretty exciting. Um, DevTools, again, lots of accessibility improvements. Um, working on a REPL mode, which is pretty exciting, which is still experimental, um, allowing web developers to trigger dark mode um, in DevTools. Um, and now this is uh, fairly recent, is that DevTools is being moved into a separate repository um, to allow for a quicker turnaround. Um, we've also been doing uh, things that are outside of the Chromium code base itself. Um, so the team, uh, Shubi's team has, and Ojan's team have been uh, submitting PRs to next.js. Um, this allowed you know, a site like barnabies.com to basically pull in an updated version of next.js, so they you know, basically you know, synced ahead. And this allowed their, Java, their JavaScript bundle size to go from you know, about a megabyte down to you know, 750 kilobytes. So Barnabies you know, basically did nothing but they received you know, a huge reduction in the JS bundle size. Um, so this is you know, how we can start you know, activating um, other areas of the ecosystem by contributing to you know, meta, meta frameworks and whatnot. Um, a big thing in security is that site isolation has been brought to Android. We sort of mitigate Spectre um, and meltdown uh, types of attacks on Android, um, which is really uh, pretty awesome. And I think that's it, hooray! <laughs> Um, if I didn't talk about uh, your area, I'm very, very sorry, um, but you just need to pay me more money next time. So thank you for the last six months um, of work, and here's to another great six months going forward.